Um, what's also interesting is now that we look a little bit uh, shorter term and looking at um, obviously the gold and silver markets uh, as we see them now and where the sovereign levels are and where, and where the paper market flows meet and cross. And, and what is so interesting is since um, Basel III NSFR conditions uh, kicked in at the first, first trading day of 2023, up until then, uh, they were not in place. Uh, they were, they were the, certainly the first year banks, first year banks were uh, accumulating gold and silver for their own, but physical gold and silver for their own books. Um, but I think one of the big mistakes, uh, and I think this is an interesting dynamic, uh, the Fed um, introduced a wall of paper gold supply in March of last year, March, April of last year, literal wall of it just at a time when you have a conflict where what should happen? Safe havens, all safe havens should be going up in value. Um, and gold and silver naturally should have been rising. And they were. So what happens is you then dilute it with a massive wall of paper supply. What is interesting, though, is the Fed never closed most of those bets off. In fact, what was ludicrous is just at the same time that the Bank of International Settlements was covering all 500 tons of their 2022 gold liabilities to zero in November. Yeah, yeah, there was 100 tons I borrowed, but that was by the Fed. And but, but basically, the Fed is now literally holding the bag. They were shorting believing that they could, not realizing how this was, these sanctions were blowing back, what Russia would do, what China would do, what these land bridges were doing, you know, the, the BRICS currencies coming into place, blockchain, uh, gold going on the, on the um, you know, I mean, they not figured any of this. They were blind to it. Daniela Di Martha Booth is, is so smart, smart cookie. And she, I remember she, we, she was on one of our shows and she said, you know, the Fed has no understanding. They don't even talk about gold. They don't even think they talk about gold. They don't. Even, it's not on their radar. So obviously we have the plunge protection team. We have those guys who are orchestrating these things. But the Fed just has no clue. And putting that wall of paper gold in, into the market was the worst thing they could have done. And now... They didn't cover it like the BIS did into Basel III uh, compliance situation. So now they're screwed. They're left holding the bag. And we and, I, and obviously a lot of our clients say, oh, no, well, you know what they're going to do. They'll always win. Sorry, but there's a certain thing called a physical supply. So if you EFP, you take a, a COMEX contract and you EFP it into a Basel III compliant spot deliverable contract, which T plus two has to be delivered. You're a liquidity provider holding that, that, that spot position. You have to have it. Suddenly, you, you've, got a, you've got a wall that you cannot go beyond. You cannot just keep creating more, more paper gold because all you're doing is allowing central banks around the world to fix that spot price, take it away, off the ring fence it goes, and into, the, to, into Russia, China, to back their currencies more and more with gold. And we know what happened to the ruble when that happened. So this is, again, people need to think about this stuff. Yeah, one of the things that you highlighted that, that we do cover on the show is the EFP mechanism. And what happens is in the COMEX, just to explain this for people who don't understand how the worldwide markets work, the, the COMEX and the NYMEX, the, the four uh, markets that are uh, commodities markets that uh, we trade here in the US, um, they, not every month is a big delivery month. So if you actually, and, and I don't think the exchanges were set up to be big delivery exchanges because for years and years, they were basically just paper trading, some hedging, some speculation. In the last 10 years, it's been more delivery, especially in the last five. And if you look at it, people are going to that market to, to get supply. And a lot of it was because there were shortages specifically in silver, but I think they also wanted access. It's a good place to get gold in bulk. And so if you want to do it, you go there. And so the deliveries have gone up, but what happens is in Comex, there's only about six strong delivery months a year. The other six months really are just lightly traded. So the next big months in gold and silver are coming up, you know, May, June, July. So in between that time, if you want access to the physical metal, you do the EFP, you take your, your US-based contract, go over you know, to the UK market. And 
I've seen those spike up tremendously. I've seen days in which you're having 7,000 contracts of gold move over. And I'm like, that's a tremendous amount. I've never seen that much. And what that symbolized to me, and maybe Andrew, you can clear this up because you know, you know that side of the market a little bit better than I do, but it seems as though there is this incredible demand for precious metals in the US, especially silver, and that we don't have the supply. Either it's because we don't have it readily available or it's just not there and the numbers that we're looking at are not accurate. And it seems to me that people are searching around for delivery. One other thing I noticed is the delivery numbers on, on Shanghai and China have, have gone up. They were, they were higher on average in the Western markets, but I think last month there was something like 77% physical delivery on traded contracts in gold, and that is tr tremendous. So there is a huge thirst for gold, physical gold and silver in the worldwide market, and the paper markets just aren't serving that right now. And that's why I think that we're gonna have a huge uptick in the paper price because at some point when those physical short especially in silver start where you actually can't get the silver that you want and that word comes out i think that you're going to go maybe bid vertical on the comex market and it would be a lot like nickel and the lme it'd be very difficult to get access to it and it may stop trading and and it wouldn't surprise me if we see that on the markets at some point in the future paper market is now meeting the physical market and people don't realize how important those Basel III and SFR uh, conditions uh, have made uh, upon us. Yeah, and I had a question for you, Andrew, on that. Do you think the long-term effects of, of the Basel requirements will you know, force that trade out of COMEX? Because if, if they can't be compliant, doesn't that put the onus on the rest of the exchanges kind of pick up the slack? And does that put pressure on the, on the American exchanges? Uh, well, I mean, ideally, uh, you, you have to raise the price to where the physical price is. So if there's a physical demand at a certain price in the spot market, which is 10 times really bigger than the COMEX anyway, if there's a physical price, if somebody's there to buy it, um, bring it on. Um, and so you need to then raise your price to that level. And the Fed, the Fed, look, all they have to do is print some bloody money. They just print enough money. Yes, they'll have to buy back these positions, but what it'll do is just force the price higher anyway. Uh, it, it doesn't matter to them. I mean, the, what, how many trillions? <laughs> Rob, how many trillions have they printed already? You probably know that. I don't know that number. What's it? You know, it's, it's trillions, isn't it? How many in the last year, how many trillions have they printed? And so now you have a situation where there's not a lot of liquidity and it's affecting repo markets and things like that. It's going to affect the rest of the system. And that's really how that system is starting to crumble and crash is uh, and, but the final risk and what's really going to kill it is the rest of the world rejecting the dollar. And eventually those, and I think it's happening right now, those euro dollars, which is any dollar held outside the U.S. Originally, they were mostly in Europe, but they're all over the world. They're called euro, euro dollar counts. It's any foreign held dollar are starting to make their way back to America. Because as these contracts get built out and as people trade in alternative currencies, gold, uh, renminbi, digital renminbi uh, potentially, and all these other currencies, the need for dollars is falling across the world and those euro dollars are going to come back and there's more physical dollars outside the US than there is in. And so if you're talking about potential for a hyperinflationary episode, you know, those those euro dollars become very important. And prior to we exported those dollars, we were exporting our inflation. Thank you so much for coming and joining us.